Welcome to today's webinar on absolute quantification of pathogen outer membrane proteins using targeted mass spectrometry. My name is Matija Rojnik and today I have a pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Alexander Schmidt, who is a group leader in the Biocentrum at the University of Basel, Switzerland. Dr. Schmidt graduated from the University of Erlangen Nuremberg in 2001 and received his PhD in biochemistry in 2006, working at the Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry. After his PhD, he joined the group of Rudy Ebersold at TTH Zurich as a postdoc and developed sensitive targeted mass spectrometric approaches for biomarker discovery and absolute quantification of proteins and their modifications. Since December 2009, he's heading the proteomics core facility of the Biocentrum at the University of Basel and continuing to develop new quantitative mass spectrometric methods for cell and systems biology applications with a focus on cell signaling and microbiology research. Today, Alex will present his work on understanding membrane protein dynamics on surfaces of pathogens to discover possible antibiotic uptake routes. In his core facility, Alex employs Biognosis Targeted Proteomics Platform centered around Spectrodive software. And we are interested to hear how Biognosis Solutions has helped him with his research. After the presentation, we will have time to discuss some questions. Please type your questions in the question box on the, your right hand side. Like any other webinar presented by Biognosis, this webinar will be recorded and sent to all participants afterwards. If you want to know more about the workflow offered by Biognosis or have questions that were not addressed in the webinar, please contact us at support at biognosis.ch. Alex, the floor is now yours. Yes. All right. So thanks for the invitation and introduction. Um, yeah, I will tell you today about uh, this after quantification um, of let me check this. Okay, um, of outer membrane proteins in targeted mass spectrometry. Um, okay. Yes, that's good. Okay, so I'll give you an overview. Um, I will introduce a bit uh, what we are doing at our proteomics core facility. Um, what are the main main projects? Just briefly, and uh, that we have a lot of small scale target analysis. But we also have uh, an increasing amount of uh, large-scale SRM projects, so target MS projects, and uh, one of them is the actual quantification of outer membrane proteins in bacteria. And I will show briefly how we how we start with that, how we develop the assays, and so we develop an automatic workflow for this and um, an application to Pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa. And um, we also have I also will show an outlook. We made some tests um, to improve the sensitivity. And also, since we have a new um, Q-executive HF, we are also running some PRM measurements and also some HRM or SWOF measurements. Um, and this looks also very promising, and I will show some, some brief results of this. Okay, so first, the introduction to our facility. So basically, we are um, six people. <coughs> um, so the uh, facility is currently co-headed by myself and Paul. Um, Paul is trying um, next year, and then I will take over, so that's that's why we have in the moment a shared directorship. Um, we have Emmanuel, Tom, who just joined, Eric, um, who is responsible for the IT, and also Zed, um, who is taking care of samples and mass specs. From the instrumentation uh, and methods, um, we have two arbitrary leads, um, which are mainly used for discovery measurements, so identification of unknown proteins and analysis of, uh, of modifications. I have to say they are very reliable instruments um, and then very useful. We also have now an arbitrary Blumos, which just was installed like a few weeks ago, and a QExective um, HF asset, like you know, for almost two years. Um, we also have a triple quad instrument that we basically only use for SRM measurements, and this is for, um, yeah, as everyone knows, basically sensitive measurements of or quantification of selected proteins, so on a small scale, but it's uh, highly sensitive and very specific. Uh, and we also use it for absolute quantification. In the future, of course, this LUMOS and QExective instruments uh, are actually very interesting for us because you can actually do both with them. So you can do it, use it as a discovery tool, but also as a scoring tool. <coughs> that makes them really, really interesting. Okay, so the main workflows at the, our facility. Uh, mostly, um, we do, of course, actually any, every project is a quantitative project. Uh, but I have to say that most of them are still run in standard DDA, so data-dependent acquisition mode, and we also have our label-free quantification pipeline, 
it will use, and for most projects, this has sufficient sensitivity and coverage um, to, to get enough uh, data. So usually people come, <coughs> uh, and, and, and we start usually with this, with this workflow, and actually we have enough hits, and um, yeah, I mean, basically they usually expect a few hits, uh, but we give them a few hundred hits or a thousand hits, and then they are actually almost overwhelmed, so they don't need a deeper coverage for this. So what we use is, uh, we use standard DBA runs, we use uh, Progenesis <coughs> IQ for label free quantification, um, where we align the runs, so we acquire basically so-called uh, maps of each run, so each dot basically represents a peptide or a peptide ion signal, and that is aligned based on the pattern across all runs, um, and then store the so-called master map, which contains basically the, the master charge ratio and illusion times and the intensities of these peptides across all samples. And if there's an MS2 trigger, then of course we also add the identification information to this master list. I mean, this workflow works very nice, uh, up to, let's say, I mean, it works very nice to 30 to, yeah, around 30, 40 samples. Um, it's very depending, of course, on a, on a, a robust um, LC system. Um, but for this uh, number of samples, it works really, really nicely. And uh, we also developed a tool uh, called SafeQuant that can actually validate the hits <coughs> and uh, make some statistical analysis to find the, the differences in these uh, proteins. <laughs> So the coverage is about three to 4,000 um, with the new instruments, maybe a bit higher in a two hour gradient time. And we apply it to almost everything, but for bacteria, for example, or yeast analysis. And if it's not too many samples, which we mostly have, then it's totally fine. Or if you look at subproteomes, then it's also a nice method. Um, we also have some targeted projects and this is getting more. It's uh, usually most of them actually small scale and uh, mostly uh, Western blood replacements. As I say, so basically people come and say, ah, they have a knockout or knockdown, and they want to check if it's really true, if it, if it hits the right gene, um, or how much the knockdown was, or a quantification of a specific PTM, mostly phosphorylation, or absolute quantification of such uh, transcription factors. Um, so usually these are, are low abundant um, proteins, uh, and there the target uh, MS makes a lot of sense. And we use mostly Skyline for this, because simply it's very flexible and easy to use. And particularly with uh, PRM, we get really nice results. Um, as you can see here, for example, this is a phosphocyte which was analyzed directly in a, in a cell isolate. And with PRM, you can actually uh, increase the resolution and also the fill time. And uh, this allows you to really get super sensitive and very selective. Um, basically, a lot of proteins and a lot of projects uh, could not quantify the protein actually even after fractionation using um, TNT quantification, for example, but with, the, with this approach um, and ordering heavy peptides, we were able to quantify um, the protein. So that was quite nice. The only thing is with Skyline a bit that uh, we had large projects and at least in our hands, it was not so straightforward um, to get a robust uh, peak detection. So we had to manually check most of the data and, um, and that of course made it very, uh, yeah, it took a lot of time actually to analyze larger sets when you were more than 50 proteins or more than 20 samples involved. And then we, um, we heard about Biognosis and the Spectre Dive tool and we used it and we're quite happy with that. So we think that with this IRT, um, <coughs> yeah, and, and also the calculation of the Q values, um, this tool provided a much better um, detection of the correct peak. And we applied it to a large scale projects. And um, as I said, we, I want to show you an example, which is the absolute quantification of autoimmune proteins and bacteria. And the first thing we developed is, uh, was a workflow to set up the assays. So in, uh, in Skyland, for example, you can just give it the, the, the protein uh, sequence and it will make everything automatically. Uh, in in SpectreDive, there's a bit more work involved to set up the assays. Um, which is totally fine because these are usually used for um, for larger scale projects. So you make a you make a list of peptides, come to that where where we get them from. But usually we picked uh, um, seven peptides for protein. We ordered the heavy uh, labeled versions, so we can order them quite cheaply now. <laughs> for example, from JPT. Um, uh, so it's no problem to order seven peptides. They are not purified. Um, so they, they basically also contain still the truncated versions, but this, for the final analysis, this, this not, uh, is not a problem. 
So we add, so we have these peptide mixtures, we add the IRT times, uh, IRT standard peptides, and then um, we run the samples on a, on a Q-executive. Um, you can run them DDA mode, we also use uh, directed um, LCMS mode, which means that we, we give the instrument a list uh, of precursors, which is the full length, which are the masses of the full length peptides, and then we specifically uh, trigger MS2 scans um, for those uh, precursor ions. So this increases actually the coverage of the, the MS2, um, yeah, of the, of the synthesized peptides. And then we run this, um, we analyze this by MaxQuant. Uh, <coughs> the analysis, uh, analysis is done automatically with MaxQuant, um, which provides precursor intensities and also fragment intensities, which are then used in an in-house tool, which was done uh, by, by Eric, um, to come up with panels for SpectroDive, which can be directly loaded into the software and used for SMM measurements. So I want to stress one point, actually, for this target analysis, which is the selection of the of the proteotypic peptide, which are used to quantify the protein. Um, in our hands, it makes a huge difference, and I think there's not enough efforts put in um, which peptides to choose for protein. So the basic thing is that if you have, if you do an LCMS analysis, you don't find the whole sequence, but rather part of the sequence. Um, this might be due to modifications or miscleavages. Um, and from this, what you find, um, you of course want to select the most intense uh, peptide ions. So it has to be easily detectable by MS, suitable for quantification, means no methionines, for example, no uh, glutamate, uh, glutamine at the end terminus, and full triptych. The sequence should be unique to one protein, and we also uh, found, or other people also found, that some um, cleavage sites are not so well cleaved by trypsin, and they should be avoided. Uh, so one thing what I want to mention is that in the discovery phase, if you, there are now a lot of collections of proteomics experiments, and there used to be peptide atlas, SRM atlas, but I also want to stress, uh, or say that also in the Mann lab and the Küster lab, there are really good databases which are very comprehensive, in particular for uh, human samples. So you have a wide selection of peptides, even if they're from low abundant uh, proteins, to find some, some peptides. The thing is that um, what we have seen is that it's still better to have your own data because you don't know if it was from purified sample or you don't have the same sample, so it's better to actually make your own data with that. <clears throat> so ideally you have a protein that is quite abundant and, and run in a 1D LCMS run. Um, so if this is a low abundant protein which uh, has a low coverage, um, we usually do an IP if possible to find more peptides. If this is not possible, um, we usually just order uh, 10 to 20 G peptides, um, uh, which are uh, unpurified, but the amount of peptide is, is in a range of twofold. So the peptides that give there the best results also should give the best results in uh, in, the, in the real protein. And the reason um, what we what we do is now there are prediction tools, of course, is predict the best the best flying peptides, but um, they are all based on uh, on DDA or shotgun data. And the problem is a bit that uh, a peptide that is, that is identified in shotgun or preferably um, identified in shotgun runs is usually longer and has a lot of fragments, whereas peptides that are very good suited for SRM analysis or target analysis uh, usually have a few transitions and are very intense. So these few transitions might not give the highest score in a database search. So what we have shown uh, earlier, or publication two years ago, is that um, the limit of detection of peptides is really uh, length dependent, so shorter peptides tend to give uh, a higher or lower limit of detection, whereas larger peptides tend to have a higher limit of detection. So in our hands, what we do is we just order, based on the filtering criteria from the beginning, 10 to 20 peptides, starting with the with seven amino acids and going up to um, um, 15 amino acids or so. Then uh, the next thing is, of course, we, we have to select the best transitions and uh, the best peptides from these, uh, from any source. And uh, normally what is done is the precursor ion is, is taken, but this does not reflect usually the, the fragment ion intensities. So um, we need or we develop the tool that can actually translate or use, make use of the precursor intensities and the fragment intensities to make the peptides comparable um, for one given protein. This works as follows. So we do a DDA LCMS analysis. 
and let's say we have uh, two different peptides from, uh, from the same protein. Um, you would look at the NSMS identification, they're both identified and they roughly show the same fragment intensities. Now the problem with the DDA run is that the triggering of the MS2 is not always at the apex, but it's rather at the beginning in most cases. So in this case, the, uh, on the left hand, so this, this uh, peptide shows a much higher intensity, but the MS2 is triggered at the beginning, whereas in the second one it's triggered at the apex. Um, so of course, if, if the MS2 would be triggered at the apex, um, the intensity of the fragments would also increase. So, um, and we have a tool, or this tool, what it does is basically takes the information from MaxQuant, meaning the intensity of the fragments, um, or the assigned fragments, the intensity of the, of the, um, of the peak, precursor ion peak, and the intensity at the point of triggering the MS2. And if you have that, you can actually translate uh, or recalculate the intensities of the fragments and make them comparable that they're all basically based on the apex and make the peptide fragments, uh, the transitions comparable for one protein. So what this tool does, so if we, if we, if we give them this, we make this DDA run, including the IRT um, peptides, um, it does this uh, IRT time calculation. It goes to check if the times are, if the illusion was, was nice, um, then it ranks the peptides based on the highest transition for a given protein. And then we can select the best uh, transitions in proteins from, from this. And it does this actually for all proteins um, that are actually identified in the sample. And then it makes a list uh, of, uh, yeah, a list of all the information required um, to make this panel in SpectroDive. So this list can be directly imported into SpectroDive. Um, also, what it also does is that in most of the cases, in many cases, we actually have only heavy peptides. Um, it also calculates the masses of the of the light, uh, corresponding light peptides, because the, the fragment uh, ratios are the same and the retention time is the same, so it's easy to calculate the missing values. So we get a complete panel um, from this tool. Okay, then we have the application to Pseudomonas uh, samples. So this is a huge, uh, huge consortium actually and, uh, and a huge project. Um, I like the name actually, it's called uh, New Drugs for Bad Bugs. So basically, what is I mean, it's it's been known that that this antibiotics at some time at, at some point will reach uh, a limit and no longer be uh, useful um, in the future. So there's a, a strong need to develop new antibiotics, and this is a really uh, a large project uh, involving like 18 academic groups, four big pharma companies, and also three biotech companies. <laughs> and one working package is the the proteomics, and uh, the basic principle of this is. Um, uh, for the proteomics is to start at the outer membrane composition. And why is this important? So the, the pseudomonas, if you grow them uh, in, uh, in the standard screening conditions, I mean, some outer membrane products are, are expressed, and the same is true for in vivo. But if you treat them with antibiotic, in, uh, if you make this uh, in vitro data, or if you grow them on, the, on a plate, they die, but in vivo, they live happily and don't die from the same antibiotic. So the reason is that there's a different uh, outer membrane uh, protein composition or different um, other proteins are uh, expressed that uh, that prevent the antibiotic to enter the, the bacteria and kill it. So that's why, of course, it's important to see okay what is the difference in, in the surface proteome of these uh, bacteria, and and there are a few acute infection models, which is uh, the septi sema model. Um, which is done by or provided by Basilea Pharmaceutica. It's a simple model for a late stage uh, infection. Um, so basically, the bacteria just injected in a certain uh, part of the mice, and then the blood is taken um, as a source. We have also intranasal lung infection, which mimics more the, the healthy humans. So basically, the bacteria actually um, are injected or provided by inhaling um, the bacteria. And then there's another model. Um, which is called the interpronchial installation. Um, this is uh, this is it's a very deep infection, and the bacteria really directly transported into the lung um, <clears throat> and can happily go there because they're also covered um, and protected from the immune system. So to make the first uh, samples, we use this uh, the septicema model uh, from Basilea. And the first thing what was done was the no, the, the mice were not infected by normal pseudomonas, but with pseudomonas is expressed uh, GFP, which makes it much easier to, uh, later on to separate them from the, um, 
from the mouse or rat um, cells. So we had uh, 24 uh, hours of infection, and then basically the bacteria were collected and then sorted by flow cytometry. And uh, you can see actually that, that this works really nicely. I mean, it's also done by the, by the Buman group, which is actually uh, taking care of this project. Um, and there you can really see that the host uh, debris is really nice to separate from the chief P level bacteria. And that's why you get very clean samples. It makes it very nice to set up the method. You can also see that the number of uh, uh, coliform units is really increased after 24 hours. So you can see that the, that the bacteria actually grow happily in the, in the mice for this one day of infection. The one experiment, so the first experiment that was done was actually uh, done by, uh, by Christian Schleberger, which has now left actually the biocentrum, but who initially pushed this project. And so Timo, he has also left and was working in, in the facility, the photonics facility. And they made this screen where they just compared basically this in vivo bacteria with uh, bacteria, the same bacteria strain grown in uh, MHB media. And you can see that um, the civil porins, which make up most of the outer membrane protein mass, are actually not changed or altered to these two uh, conditions. But that gated porins, which are mainly responsible for ion uptake um, and, uh, and efflux pumps, are actually highly upregulated in the in vivo sample. So based on this, um, Dirk actually considered uh, three subprojects. And one project, which is hosted by Pamela, um, is um, the true and horse antibiotics, which are actually based on this ion uptake. So these are basically antibiotics which are covered uh, in four like molecules. Zero four um, source are, are molecules that are actually extruded, uh, secreted by the bacteria and, and have a very high affinity for iron. So iron is, is very scarce for the bacteria, highly, uh, highly required. So there's a, a strong fight for iron. And they have these molecules that they send out into the environment to pick up iron, and they have receptors that pick up the cytophores and, and take the iron. <clears throat> so basically the idea is that you couple uh, an antibiotic to this cytophore-like molecules, and then you, you trigger an active uptake by pseudomonas to really be sure that the antibiotic enters the bacteria. So one, one idea is, of course, to see, okay, what cytophore receptors are actually expressed in vivo, and um, what are higher expressed, if the, are the standard conditions actually good? Uh, compared to in vivo model, and of course there are knockouts. The most abundant receptors, how they change, and do alternative targets come up. Then the second project, which is done by Julia, and uh, so he's uh, taking care or analyzing the simple point, uh, simple points, which are thought to be the main uh, gateways for antibiotics. Um, as the most abundant groups, so what do you think that these uh, the simple points actually take the antibiotics, and uh, and internalize them into the cell. So we basically made single knockouts of the 10 most abundant points of the new conditions. He also is working on, on knockouts of all uh, points and um, also single knock-ins. He makes competition assays and uh, yeah, and how and he investigates how pseudomonas compensates for the lack of points in vivo. So this is a very tough project and it uh, was quite surprising to see that uh, that these uh, simple points actually had not such, that's not the effect that was expected. <laughs> so basically they have almost no effect. Um, and also another project was to establish this method for, uh, for uh, SRM measurements. So the, the idea was a bit that to, in, to use SRM instead of the CDA method to have a higher sensitivity and higher precision for clinical samples. Um, and one thing was also to avoid this fuck sorting because it's a long procedure and we lose sample. And of course, we cannot, in, in human samples, or human, yeah, from human patient samples, you will not have fluorescent um, bacteria. So it's important to, to avoid this back sorting and try to find a method that can be used um, for also human samples. So one model to set it up was this GSK model, um, um, where the bacteria actually directly uh, loaded into the lung of the rat. And in this case, we took unlabeled pseudomonas and um, we grow it, we took the bacteria out of the 24 hours of infection, and we did again a shotgun approach and a SRM approach, and to see if we can find um, changes in the outer membrane, uh, outer membrane proteome composition. And as you can see here, so this is the same. <coughs> um, so this, this bacteria actually from coming from infected mice 
and also uh, grown on this MHB media again. And as you can see, I mean, the same receptors as found previously from the other model are actually upregulated. And uh, so basically we can use, even without fax sorting, we can come up, and SRM, we can come up and find these, um, the same regulated uh, automatic proteins as with the previous model. So I said, um, Schulman put a lot of efforts in this, and uh, he looked at the semaphorins. What is what is good was good to see is that if you um, grow this PA14 strain, which was used um, in most of the cases, uh, grown in this MHB media, you have a certain composition. You can see that most of the of the autonomic protein, the semaphorins, are actually not expressed, but uh, some of them are, of course. And if you look at the in vivo uh, data from um, from animals, uh, you can see that the expression pattern is very much it's very similar. So this MHB media is a in vitro sample, is a very good mimicking the, the in vivo uh, data. And from clinical strains, um, you can see that if you, if you take these clinical uh, pseudomonas strains and you draw them in this uh, MHB media, you can see that they, that they have a very similar pattern to actually this, this PA14. But if you look at the in vi real in vivo data, you can see that um, the expression is totally, is very different actually and has a very chaotic shape, so some are expressed, some not, and uh, <coughs> yeah, exactly, but, but basically what is, what is nice to see is that the, um, that the sporins, which are not expressed here, also in the, on all strains are also not expressed as making the samples. So there is a bit of a variation, but in, in basically um, the more or less similar expression patterns um, compared from the clinical samples compared to the animal models and also from the in vitro strains. Um, then we have the strain horse antibiotics, uh, which is done by Pamela, this, this project. So again, as I said, this acetylopores are um, molecules that have very high affinity for iron, and um, they are basically the pick up iron and, and transport it to the uh, reporters um, and um, receptors. So these are these totally B-dependent receptors, which take up the iron and put this in and, and transport it actively into the cell. And the idea of this antibiotic uh, coupled to cytophores is that uh, you actually, yeah, you couple the, the antibiotic to this um, cytophores, and then with the iron, this antibiotic is also actively transported into the cell. And there, it's a bit different. So if we look here um, in the in vitro model, also um, when we grow this PA14 strain in MHB media in vitro, you can see that there is some expression of a few proteins. But if you look at the in vivo mouse, uh, in new mouse and rat uh, samples, you can see the expression of this protein is very different. So we have definitely a clear difference between the in vitro samples and the in vivo samples. And the same is true for the, um, for the clinical strains. So if you look at the clinical strains and you grow them in vitro, you can see that there is some expression, but it's highly variable. And if you look at the patient samples, I mean, it's, very, it's very different um, to the in vitro samples. So there's clearly, uh, Yes, there's clearly a need for a better um, media to grow it, and this is particularly interesting because, for example, there have been already some um, trial horse uh, antibiotics developed, um, which uh, actually use this uh, Tom B dependent receptors PUA, PUD, and PRA, and you can see in the in vitro um, samples they're basically expressed uh, quite well across all strains, but if you look at the in vivo sample, I mean, for example, this PUA, we're not able to detect it actually across all samples. So this is not expressed, and therefore, I mean, this antibiotic will not be so useful in the in vivo data, uh, in vivo um, conditions. And it's just to show that we get a nice signal, and we can really nicely quantify, for example, this PRA protein. So you can see we get a really nice signal. We can, if it's absent, we're quite sure that this protein is quite lowly expressed. And also, of course, then the question is, I mean, does it, is there a better media? I mean, this MHB media is just used to grow this, this uh, pseudomonas. It's not, uh, it's not pretty optimized for in vivo conditions. And uh, what Pam found is that this M9 succinate um, media, which is a minimal medium, which contains just salts, uh, mimics best, actually, the in vivo con uh, conditions. And this would be very interesting, I guess, to use and optimize some uh, train horse antibiotics. Okay, so um, an outlook, um, just a few things that we did. Uh, one was um, we actually started like a few months ago with DMSO, adding this to the LC buffer. I mean, we also, this was a paper from, um, from the Crystal Lab in 2013. I mean, 
looked for interesting because it increased the sensitivity for uh, and the coverage in DDA based uh, approaches and we tried it out but we had some troubles with uh, polymers or signals that actually came after two weeks and we really it was really difficult to get rid of them again and um, so we basically skipped it and then I talked to somebody at the ASMS and he said that uh, in his hands it works fine and they used exactly the same solvents as he used and we start with the our Vantage on the triple quad and I have to say now for a few months we use it and it really works nicely so we don't see this this polymers anymore and as you can also see this is really an easy way to increase the sensitivity of your machine. I mean, we have a standard approach, 5 femtomol of BSA, to test the sensitivity of the machine. And so we have a lot of injections, actually, and we know roughly what is, what is a good result and what. So on the left side, you see one of the best runs that we had before um, using the MSO. So we picked two good peptides and one peptide that was hardly visible. Um, and if we add the MSO, you can see that the sensitivity actually increased two to three fold for the high abundant ones and here is actually more than tenfold for this low abundant peptide. So it's actually really nice. Um, we are still reluctant to actually add it, um, use it also for the elite and on the, the Q executive because um, the DMSO actually nothing binds anymore to the column and it's, it has been, I mean Thermos said that basically um, in the crystal where they use it, they have to clean the, the Q executive for example every, every month and since we already have some troubles with cleaning the instrument we do not want to um, to make actually the cleaning more often, so we actually will now just keep it for the uh, triple quad instrument. Still, we use the the, the Q executive now for PRM measurements, and um, as you can see, there's one one uh, one peptide um, from this uh, Tombi or pyridine receptor, and you can see in vitro data. It's very nice, of course, and very clean samples. Um, if you if you have in vivo, um, so you from your patient samples, you can see the signal is really low. So the question is, if it expressed or not, is a bit difficult because there's so much noise in the data when we use the the low resolution triple quad uh, instrument. But if we um, now use PRM um, method, which has a much higher resolution, we can uh, of course there's there's really almost no noise in the data, and um, so it's actually a thousand times lower. We still have to see if it translates also into um, in the real abundance or if there's another threshold because the thing is that for, for this project it's very important to say this, uh, to know the detection limit of the single uh, assays that we can say okay this receptor is expressed below 100 copies or below 1000 copies. It makes a huge difference if we can say that and, and the lower the better. In this case it would go down to 0 0.5 molecules per cell um, which is of course great because then uh, then we can really be sure and say, okay, this is below this, and that is not so important for the antibiotic uptake. And again, of course, we also have examples where we have nice signal um, with PRM, but not so nice signal with SRM. I mean, it's quite um, straightforward. So, in the, just briefly, in the last slides, I want to say something about this, this swap or HRM data set that we're also starting to do now. Um, we made a library, so we have, uh, we, I think we put a lot of efforts in this library because we have in vitro stationary phase and exponential phase uh, peptides. We have uh, many outer membrane proteins are not expressed actually, so we have recombinant um, outer membrane proteins in Purify where we have data from. Um, we also add this heavy isotope label peptides, the light peptides, and also this HRM and IRT kit. So this is a quite sophisticated library that contains uh, roughly 3,000 proteins. And as you can see, if we do in the vitro sample, we almost uh, and we do a SWOF analysis, actually we almost found all of them um, in 2007 proteins, but even in the uh, in vivo samples, um, even with low number of cells, we still find almost, I mean, more than 1,000 um, proteins from pseudomonas. So there's certainly in the samples much more information that we can actually exploit when using the SWOF analysis. And uh, it's of course also clear that if you do SRM and SWOF, I mean, they show the same results for many, in many cases. But overall, I mean, as, at least so far, we can say that SRM is actually more sensitive than SWOF. And uh, I guess in the future we'll do a SWOF analysis, and then from the peptides that are tricky to find or uh, not covered, actually, we'll do another uh, PRM or SRM analysis. Okay, so in the conclusion, I mean, I can I hope we could show you that we found or established a workflow that enables the quantification of autoimmune proteins from pseudomonas. <coughs> I mean, from different sources, also including human samples, which was really tricky. Um, 
we can also uh, um, use this or adapt this workflow for other bacteria and uh, and diseases. Um, it allows allows the production of large number of samples in a screening fashion. Um, I also think the, the the setup of the workflow is quite automated and it's easy to to set it up for other um, samples. Um, as to the results, I mean, what Julian showed is that there's no uh, modulation of simple points on different conditions. <coughs> so basically, this means that the role of simple points for antibiotic translocation is, is, is rather small. Um, very interesting are the strongly dependent receptors, which are in comparison very highly strongly depending on the environment. <coughs> and I think it's good. Uh, Pamela showed also some nice work that, um, that sheds a bit more light into when these uh, receptors are expressed. And um, we can find or define a good media to actually make further work on this. Uh, Outlook, I mean, we have the, as I said, the DMSO, the PRM, and the SWOF uh, in the pipeline, which are now, now used. And we will actually put a lot of work in it to, to get, this, um, get this going. And I have to say, this, this Spectre Dive and Spectre software are really essential for this. So they're really easy to use and uh, very helpful to analyze this data fast, particularly for for larger scale um, projects. And we acknowledge I mean, most of the work that has been done, particularly for this, I mean, all of the assembly preparation animal models is done by the Buman lab, by Dirk, set up by Dirk. Um, Christian, I said, was driving the, the, the project, um, but he left now, and Pam and Julian did a lot of work as well on this, uh, on this project. <coughs> I also want to, and I want to thank them actually for a nice collaboration. It's a very interesting project. And also the Proteum's core facility, so we, this is a bit of an older picture. You see Timo here, he did uh, this initial screen. Eric um, is, did a lot of work on this IT analysis. Uh, and also um, Emmanuel and, and Tom joined, and they also involved in this project and uh, do a great work there. So that's the end, and uh, thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Thanks, Alex, for this interesting talk. Um, so let me just remind you all that uh, you can uh, ask your questions on your right, uh, right hand side in the platform under questions. Um, we have questions coming. So the first one is, um, is the in-house script that you use for MaxQuant data available for, for download or for, for um, yeah? Uh, yeah, it's not yet uh, available for download, but I can ask, uh, talk with Eric, he might, uh, we might put it online. That's not, uh, we can do that, yeah. Okay, so. Uh, I have to talk with him again, but uh, definitely, if, if somebody's interested, you can just write an email and I can, can discuss that, yes. Okay, perfect. So you, c you can contact Alex directly for the script. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so the next question is, were, uh, uh, outer membrane proteins from in vitro model identified from whole bacteria or outer membrane enriched fractions? No, no, this is all whole bacteria. Actually, it's the, the, the thing is that uh, it's, we anyway, very limited in the amount of, of bacteria we can have in many, for many samples. Um, so yeah, now we have to take the, the, whole, the whole bacteria. And actually that's, that's good because then we can also, we're also interested actually also in the metabolism and um, yeah, I mean, basically we can go for any protein, but it's not enriched for for outer membrane proteins because this membranes because this would take uh, much more cells. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, the next one is um, how do you obtain sufficient amounts of bacteria pro uh, proteins uh, out of the mouse model? So. Do you, um, as I understand, you you basically uh, collect the bacteria, you sacrifice the mice, and then collect the bacteria out of mice. Yeah, basically, yeah. We, we basically take uh, the blood. I'm actually not 100 sure if we have to sacrifice the mice, but uh, we, we need a, a, I mean, most of the case was done in blood. And then uh, for the initial screen, and as I said, I mean, we could, uh, we could find like, yeah, in the million range or 25 million range, uh, number of bacteria, that is sufficient basically to make a, a screen, yeah. It's not sufficient to make any fractionation, but for single shot analysis, it's fine. And also for SRM analysis, it's fine. I mean, overall, we, we usually work with very low amounts, it's true. And um, if you start, if you would start only with bacteria with low amounts, um, during the same preparation, you might, you always lose a bit of material. But since we have this contamination also inside, um, the loss of the bacteria is not so, uh, I mean, 
is a bit milder than if you would have pure bacteria. But in, the, in, in, in principle, yes, I fully agree that the biggest problem is actually um, to have sufficient number of bacteria. And for some samples, yeah, there's simply not enough bacteria, then, then uh, we cannot use them. So we also, because these uh, bacteria are counted before we have the, the samples, um, so we only take the, the samples actually that have sufficient number of bacteria. Thank you. Um, next question is: um, You uh, uh, last, uh, in the last couple of slides we saw that you um, already tried some other approaches, so um, not SR, not just SRM, but also PRM and especially SWAP. Um, so, what kind of advantages would you expect, you know, uh, for uh, with these new approaches in, in your work, basically, or, or what kind of applications uh, can you think of for for PRM and especially SWAP MS? Yeah, I mean, with PRM, I said, I mean, the one one important thing is that uh, it's 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 also important to show that the protein is absent from from uh, from a cell, which is always a bit difficult. I mean, you cannot be hundred percent sure, but uh, if you know the detection limit of your of your assay, you can say how how low down. I mean, what what you expect, which which I mean, the protein is below a certain level, and of course, with PRM, it seems that this level is lower than for SRM, so we can say. This, this protein is below 10 copies or so, and then it, it plays only a minor role in uh, antibiotic uptake, for example. So this is very useful for us, and I think PRM is uh, providing them more information. I mean, SWOF is something that, uh, I mean, Dirk is also very interested in the metabolism of these uh, bacteria, and of course, with SRM and, and PRM, you're a bit limited in the number of proteins that you can monitor, and uh, yeah, it's clear that with SWOF, I mean, you can, you, you get, maybe not so deep, but you get a much broader picture of the protein of this bacteria and uh, and then of course yeah I mean metabolic enzymes they are quite abundant and uh, virus on protein so you get I mean with SWOF we expect to get a bit more information about the metabolism of the of the bacteria which we otherwise would have to add new proteins uh, to the SRM assays and at some point you will be limited by the number of assays you can do. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, when you perform stable isotope labeling to analyze bacterial proteins, did you observe any problems with the incorporation of heavy labeled uh, lysine or arginine? And then the comment is maybe labeling problems uh, are the reason for using a label free analysis as a standard for bacteria. Okay, so we, we don't use actually any, uh, any isotope labeling in the bacteria. So we we always do, I mean, for the, for the discovery screens, it was done label free, so that we don't do any, uh, any isotope labeling. And for the SRM measurements, but also the SWOF measurements for these proteins that we're interested in, we added uh, synthetic heavy label peptides. So there, uh, we always measure basically the endogenous protein. So there was no, no labeling of the endogenous proteins was done, no peptides was done. So it's only, only the reference, the heavy reference was spiked in. So we don't have any labeling actually. So yeah. Okay. Um, one well, one question. I think uh, that that's from my side actually. I, I think uh, what what you show extremely uh, extremely interesting is the difference in media that can can uh, uh, can influence the uh, protein expression, uh, and that's I think hugely important for for research work in in in, in this field. So, uh, did you uh, investigate any further? Uh, what what are the reasons? You know, different media uh, uh, influences uh, the bacteria differently. Basically, why this M9 media? Uh, why is it different than the other medias? Yeah, I mean, basically, you, you um, uh, yeah. I mean, I think the the the, the thing is a bit that the, from the media, um, it depends a bit what you provide. If you provide, like, let's say, this M9 media, which is minimal, is a minimal media. I mean, the, the bacteria have to uh, to um, synthesize a lot of uh, molecules which are required, like uh, amino acids and, this, and other molecules that are essential by themselves, which basically slows the slows the, the growth of these bacteria. And then they have then these these uptake report uh, transporters, for example, are not so important. Whereas if you have, let's say, a full media um, where basically amino acids are provided, I mean, the bacteria will will have much less molecules, for example, that synthesize the amino acids, but rather put more efforts in the transporters to take up most of them to grow faster. And that, of course, you will see in the outer membrane uh, composition changes. So, yeah, it depends a bit what you have, and and, and then the, the bugs are very quick to adapt to the perfect, to basically they want to grow in the fastest fashion, and they just adapt the proton in a way that they can grow fastest. Yeah. 
Okay, that thank you. Exciting. Thank you. <laughs> then with this question, oh, sorry. Uh, Oh, yeah, so uh, there is a question actually for for, for diagnosis. Does Spectrum handle uh, SWAF data? I thought it was mainly made for 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 PRM. Is there any difference uh, in the data? Um, so basically, we have uh, two platforms. One is SpectroDive, and SpectroDive uh, software is for targeted proteomics data, um, uh, meaning uh, SRM, MRM, and and uh, SRM or, or MRM and PRM data. So PRM data is actually handled by SpectroDive. On the other hand, uh, SWAF or, or uh, DIA acquisition data is handled uh, with Spectronaut. Um, and of course, if you have any additional questions uh, on, on this, just contact us at support at biognosis.ch. Okay, then let's take the last question for Alex. How do you deal with high mutation frequency from bacteria? To ensure that peptides are select, uh, for SRM are selected for SRM are conserved across experiments. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we thought about this. So the um, there's apparently uh, like a core proteome, which is our genes pool that is uh, that is quite consistent. But uh, a quarter of these, uh, I mean, in Pseudomonas at least, a quarter of the genes are actually variable between the different. Uh, Strains and and uh, yeah, I mean thin strains and this this is something that we have to look at. We didn't do anything yet with this, um, but eventually we have to make uh, yeah to investigate this further. I think the data is out there and and actually add the um, yeah these additional genes um, to the data set. Yes, this we have to do. I mean we'd probably start with a swath library, which is a bit easier, and and try to see if we can find it. And uh, but yeah, that's a good point. This definitely is something we have to look into. Okay, thank you. Then um, I would really like to close the session with this uh, last question. I would like to thank, thank you, Alex, for, for this great presentation. Uh, in case of any questions from the audience, please don't hesitate to contact us uh, or um, Alex. So uh, I wish you all then a nice day and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.